Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on lab automation, challenges, and opportunities. Um, so first of all, I'm just going to present everyone. Uh, we have the pleasure today of being joined by Professor Ilian Banev. Uh, so Ilian is conducting research at ETS. Uh, for those who don't know, ETS is one of the largest engineering schools in Canada. Um, Ilian is working on robotics accuracy and precision. He is also the co-founder of Mechademic. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Mr. Stan Glazer. So Stan is our technical support director for Mechademic. And myself, Louis Lapierre, I am account manager for Mechademic. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in this, uh, this webinar. We have about 250 uh, participants, so we're, we're really grateful. Uh, hopefully you will all found it, find this presentation very uh, instructive. Uh, I'll quickly go over the agenda for today. Um, so Ilian is going to present the, the company. After that, I will uh, go over a brief history of lab automation and where this idea is going in the future. I will address the incentives to automate a laboratory and the challenges you will meet uh, when choosing to work with robotics in your lab. Um, we will address the two different schools of thought when integrating robots uh, in a lab context, contest. I will also go over quickly uh, the different aspects to consider when uh, talking about your return on investment. Afterwards, my colleague Stan will go over a couple of very interesting applications and video examples with robotics in the lab. Um, and by the way, if you have any questions, you can simply click the button on the top right of your screen and you can simply type them in, uh, in chat. I will hand over the, the presentation to Ilian, who is going to now uh, present Mechademic. Yeah, thank you, Louis. So um, it's my pleasure to talk a little bit about the, the, the origins of uh, Mechademic and uh, how we got into lab automation. So uh, since uh, we founded the company like more than seven years ago, our mission has always been the, to develop robots that are more accessible to end users and this is something i know because i teach robotics so i see how much time it takes for uh, you know my students to to get used to using these robots even though they just need to do a pick and place in their labs they still um, they still uh, spend a lot of time so this is our top priority how to make robots easy to use and then another another mission for us is uh, to be like the first point of access into robotics for companies looking to automate for the first time and also companies who are already uh, used to automation and we want to be um, our vision is really to become the international leader in the market of ultra compact very very small and very precise industrial robots so, so thanks so uh, <clears throat> like seven years ago when we started the company um, we uh, we just look at you know I, I have dozens of industrial robots in my lab as you probably saw uh, two minutes ago and um, one thing that we saw that it doesn't exist and even today we are pretty much the only ones to offer such a small um, such a small robot and um, <clears throat> we design it for traditional applications mostly electronics. But then, uh, then kind of two years ago or one, I don't remember exactly, then, then came the, you know, the Zymergen application, which really opened our eyes because um, before that, I just thought, oh, it's lab automation, it's just picking in place, you know, there is nothing to do special about this, but I, I was wrong. And then I, when I saw what Zymergen did, that, that really opened our eyes at the company. And since then, we've been doing lots of tests, like uh, clean room tests, uh, vacuum tests. Uh, we've improved a lot the software uh, to make it even uh, simpler, the use of the robots. We've developed uh, new technology partnerships with uh, companies uh, who can help us into the lab automation uh, field. And uh, so currently, we're working on uh, how to improve the design of the robot so it can be a higher class of uh, clean room, uh, how to have uh, certification from uh, Fraunhofer Institute, 
Uh, we also developed new products for reliable automation and uh, new accessories, for example, a long stroke uh, gripper, which is needed for uh, lab automation for handling microplates. So, Louis, uh, please give us an introduction into lab automation, and then I'll come back uh, with more details on the Mecca 500. Yeah, thank you, Lian. So, uh, first of all, just a brief history introduction of lab automation. Uh, so the first person to really invest into total lab automation, what we call TLA, is uh, Professor Sasaki in Japan in the 1980s. Um, so 40 years later in 2020, most labs are still lagging on an idea that can drastically augment, augment uh, consistency in their production. A recent nature survey indicated uh, that science is indeed facing a reproducibility crisis. Out of, out of about 1,500 researchers, more than 70% of respondents have tried and failed to reproduce another scientist's experiments. Uh, more shockingly, even half have failed to produce their own experiments. Um, so it's clear that lab automation can help uh, in the reproducibility crisis, uh, but not everyone agrees that lab automation is the way to go. And they're definitely right in some cases. Uh, for example, Roger Chen, an associate at Alpha Tech Ventures in San Francisco, uh, believes that a, a centralized automation lab um, cannot give you the freedom and flexibility to ex experiment with all the parameters you need to do some innovation. So as you can see, we still have today uh, clashing opinions for, uh, for lab automation. Um, so to simplify and better illustrate the very general term lab automation, uh, I like to split it into three different levels of autonomy. Um, so first of all, as many labs are doing, uh, you can be doing every single step by hand. So every single process, for example, dispensing in this case, would be done by hand. So the more autonomy you have, the more workflow will be captured by your automation system. Uh, for example, when you're scaling up in your lab automation, uh, you would probably invest in an, uh, a standalone apparatus like uh, this auto sensor, for example. So the feeding for such an instrument uh, can be done by hand, or the robot can put microplates in and out of this device. Um, and uh, a standalone apparatus like this one, an auto sampler, for example, can drastically augment uh, the consistency and the capability of, uh, of your lab. <clears throat> the next step is really to link apparatus together. Uh, so the extreme case is really uh, the one where you would fill a couple of containers, put in a couple of microplates in, press play, uh, go have a beer, and you would get your data at the end. So in this case, you would link your different apparatuses with uh, conveyors and robots, and you would have a constant flow between your dedicated instruments. Um, we believe every lab manager uh, has some uh, typical challenges that are common to every lab. Um, so those challenges from the point of view of someone working in automation, like myself, can be seen as incentives to automate. <clears throat> so first of all, we believe scientists should be doing science. Uh, so reducing to a minimum the time spent by highly qualified researchers uh, doing repetitive and time-consuming tasks should definitely be reduced to a minimum, and this should be an objective for every lab manager. Um, also, you should always try to avoid costly human errors uh, and even avoid contamination. So we know that some, uh, some users are working with samples that are very hard, uh, even impossible to reproduce in some cases. Uh, so of course, considering automation to avoid such uh, catastrophes is definitely a must. Uh, yeah, so I believe everyone here agrees that automation can help with those, those problems. Uh, so it's really not hard to convince someone that uh, robots can help for those problems. Uh, but however, when considering automation, uh, it can get tricky. So there are simple, there, there are some problems that your robots or your automation devices can create. <clears throat> uh, so for example, variable, th variable throughput. Uh, labs are by definition a place where uh, innovation is made. So it's, uh, it's probably not a bad idea. It's probably a, bad, a really bad idea to pour in concrete a large industrial robot uh, in a lab where research is made on subjects that are constantly evol evolving. Uh, so you want to choose automation, automation equipment that's very flexible, uh, just as flexible as your processes are. 
And robots, it's important to say they're complex technology in most cases. Uh, so usually you have to learn a whole new programming language just to get started with a new robot. Uh, ultimately, the idea is to exchange data between your robot and your life science instruments. Uh, surprisingly, it can be very complex to uh, communicate with, uh, with uh, traditional industrial robots. So you want to choose equipment that is open. <clears throat> so a common reason to choose robots in your lab is to avoid potential human contamination or errors. So of course, you don't want your robot to create uh, its own set of problem pro problematic particles. So you have to choose equipment that is clean by design. So the, the first thing to, to do when considering automation is really to define your workflow. Uh, once you have broken down your process into individual steps, uh, you have to find the ones that are most suitable for automation. So why would you automate those processes? Well, in most cases, it's simply to make them better, make it more stable, more reliable, allow you to count on the data that's being produced by those stations. <clears throat> down the line, it's also, uh, completely useless to invest colossal amounts of money on a process to make it uh, faster, so to augment its uh, production pace, if your upstream and downstream processes cannot keep up. So you really want to avoid creating bottlenecks. <clears throat> also, now, nowadays, everything is programmed. Uh, so you want to avoid the hassle of dealing with proprietary languages and uh, the lack of access between your upstream and downstream equipment. So once again, we really advise to choose open equipment. <clears throat> uh, your processes are probably always changing. You're probably always dealing with new products and concepts. So it's important that your automation equipment is just as flexible as your ideas. And what about the future? So we definitely advise to keep an open door for scalability. Uh, so for example, if you automate process A, uh, you should definitely leave the door open for the future integration of a conveyor, for example, to link it automatically without human intervention to process B. So uh, there's really no perfect recipe to uh, prepare yourself for automation, uh, but we came up with a couple of key points that we believe are always uh, a good idea to go through when considering automation. Well, first of all, as mentioned before, uh, you must define your workflow, break it down into small individual processes. Uh, the key part is really to find the best task for robotic automation. So you're really looking for an easy win here. Really start with a simple test. So there's really no need to aim for total lab automation in the first place. Give your chance a team uh, to work on an easy win. So once you, uh, you put in place your automation self, you want to tweak it and improve it uh, to make sure it's tailored for your specific process. Once your cell is up and running, you want to keep gathering data uh, to, um, to establish some metrics that allow you to confirm the success financially and to make sure it's actually making your process better. Um, once you've established and confirmed the success, uh, well, congratulations, you can build on it and the experience you will have gained will definitely help you uh, to easily find the next process that can be uh, automated as the most suitable for automation. <clears throat> so I really like this quote here. It says, uh, your process should drive the automation, not the other way around. I like this quote because we often encounter uh, lab companies that invest colossal amount of money uh, on a dedicated automation uh, solution for labs. And they actually end up adapting their process to this automation solution instead of the other way around. So often what we hear about is that uh, such behavior can uh, cause uh, unforeseen events that delay greatly the, uh, the return on investment. <clears throat> uh, when considered robotics in a lab context, there's really two schools of thought. Uh, first of all, there's the robot-centered way and the, the process-centered way. <clears throat> so the robot-centered way, as the name suggests, is a large robot. It can also be a, a medium-sized robot. And this robot is surrounded by the different uh, instruments. 
so the main purpose for the robot is, of course, to manipulate the microplates uh, between the different instruments. Uh, when working in a process-centered manner, um, the instruments each have a single robot linking them to the process. Uh, so each robot and instrument pairing uh, is called a cell. And uh, a conveyor can be used to link the different cells together uh, for, to complete your process. So here is a video example of what we call robot-centered uh, setup. <clears throat> so as you can see, the robot is really uh, linking the different components together and transporting the microplates. So when, when they're considering TLA, total lab, lab automation, uh, this way of doing things is extremely compact and optimal. Um, however, the downside is that it's quite hard to reconfigure and adapt to changing processes. So if you have a way of doing things that's going to be uh, uh, running for uh, two to three years, of course, uh, this is the way to go. But if you want to set up a modular uh, system that you're com constantly going to be updating, uh, process-centered, uh, we believe, is uh, more the way to go. So the, more re the, 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 the number one reason to consider the process-centered way of doing things um, would be flexibility. Uh, so it's quickly reconfigurable. Uh, you can literally take a cell, a robot cell, to another room and have the other cells running through your process. Uh, and it's also possible to get more throughput since um, every robot is responsible for a single instrument uh, other than having a large robot responsible for all your instruments. So it's, it's possible to go a, a bit faster. I will let my colleague Stan elaborate on that process uh, with uh, the case study from Zymergen. Yeah, well, Zymergen is, uh, is really the company that opened our eyes to lab automation in general. Um, we were aware before, and we've had a few customers here and there, but they've really uh, made us go into, uh, into this industry full force. Uh, and one of the reasons is uh, really because the robot is simple to integrate. Now, what Zymergen was really looking for, um, they weren't necessarily looking for a robot at the beginning. They were looking to either have a Cartesian system. All they needed is a way to, uh, to place their microplates from the conveyor to their instruments. Um, but this kind of development for something that they wanted to do would have taken a lot of time. And if they could use something that's available off the shelf, that simplifies the process a lot for them. So they were really looking for something that was flexible, reliable, uh, fast, easy to program, and that could overall increase uh, their throughput. But again, they weren't looking especially for a, for a robot. Uh, and for us, honestly, uh, manipulating microplates is something very simple. We've done a way more complicated things, so really we're just uh, picking and placing a microplate. Uh, but in this case, these microplates are containing samples that cost that could cost more than the robot arms uh, themselves. And again, this is what something was, Louis was talking about. These processes, they keep changing. Uh, the space requirements are changing. Uh, the samples that they're handling have, uh, have to be used with different instruments all the time. And so a centralized process is really uh, not adapted to that. But what, they, when, what they've created uh, with our Mecha 500s is uh, a system called RACS. So they're uh, reconfigurable automation carts. And what they could do is if something new uh, has to be added to their process, they could implement a new rack to the conveyor belt and then work with uh, different kinds of instruments. And so overall, uh, they managed to decrease their integration time by, by a lot thanks to, our, uh, thanks to our way of programming the robot. So they didn't have to uh, adapt themselves to our robot. Our robot's programming language basically was adapted to them. So they're using, uh, they're using Python to control uh, all of their instruments, and in this case, including the robot. So whether your company is using something like Scylla or C Sharp or uh, C++ or LabVIEW or any, or any programming language, it could be used directly uh, with our robot. Um, we're not going to play the full, uh, the full video here, but it's available on YouTube if you guys want to see it after. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, Stan. <clears throat> so um, the real beauty of um, modular lab automation is that there's no need to consider total lab automation in the first place, and you can really start small and grow. Um, a lot of people consider robotics as an all or nothing uh, type of thing. So either you invest massively to completely reconfigure your way of doing things, 
or you just keep going business as usual. Um, on, we really like to consider uh, a different approach and consider robots as modular components. Uh, so you can start with a simple uh, type of pick and place process like the ones you can see in this demo here and grow from there. So it's possible to link your different processes uh, with conveyors in the future. And of course, the cells themselves are also reconfigurable. I'll, uh, I'll quickly go over the usual financial terms when discussing uh, an automation investment. First of all, there's the ROI. For example, if you earn $1,000 on a $10,000 investment, you're getting an ROI of 10%. Uh, the real question and the question we hear more often in, uh, in automation is the payback period. So the payback period is the time for you uh, to have your investment paid by the benefits of the project. And to, uh, so in, in other words, where your ROI is of 100%. To calculate your payback period correctly, you have to use the NPV, the net present value. Uh, the NPV is the value of future benefits reinstated in terms of today's money. Uh, so I'm not going to go too deep in the details, but the, the NPV basically states that $1 at year 5 is much less valuable than $1 at year 1. For general uh, manufacturing automation, uh, automation obviously is equal to benefits. The benefits are mostly saved employee costs. Uh, saved, saved scrap, uh, additional productivity, and you will calculate your return on investment simply by doing the NPV, the net present value of your benefits over your investments. All those beautifully simple concepts are uh, very attractive, but in practice, and especially in lab automation, uh, ROIs are often an analyzed in a qualitative manner. Uh, why are they analyzed this way? It's because um, the list of potential benefits is quite large. Uh, so, for example, uh, ROI is still equal to the NPV of your, uh, of your benefits over the investment, of course. But the list of potential benefits goes on and on. So you can have uh, capability improvements, you can reduce your research timelines, uh, quality improvements, a redistribution of brain power. So uh, having your scientists doing putting more time on science instead of handling microplates and doing repetitive maneuvers. You'll reduce your error rates. Uh, your processes are getting more standard, more reliable, safer, et cetera, et cetera. And the list really goes on. So all of those benefits can be traduced uh, to financial gain. <clears throat> can automation also bring financial loss? Of course it can. Uh, for example, if you purchased a very complex piece of automation equipment, uh, the training and adoption time before the learning curve kicks in uh, can take a few months. So, of course, uh, this translates into a potential loss. So, you have less freedom because of the new automation equipment. Uh, are certain things now impossible for you and your team uh, because of the, uh, the constraints that your automation has posed? Are you less flexible? Is it uh, slower for you and your team to adapt to changes? So, that really depends. So, you really must choose your automation solution according to which factors are the most critical for your process. So um, I really advise to go for the easy wins. Uh, for example, uh, you, you probably have a really easy, a, a process that would be really easy and cost effective to automate in your lab. For example, we were working with a pharmaceutical drug company uh, that had to have employees come in on Saturdays to remove uh, used containers on a bioreactor and simply add in the new ones. <clears throat> so unfortunately, this process uh, could not be done during regular work hours uh, due to the, uh, the operation of the process. <clears throat> so for them, uh, buy-in programming a robot to simply uh, exchange the containers was an obvious easy win. So it was a low cost initial investment uh, that saved the weekend shift for life uh, while avoiding possible human contamination and errors. <clears throat> this is really the mentality we're trying, trying to, uh, to promote. So there's no need to go for total lab automation in the first place. Uh, you and your team should really try to, uh, to find an easy win and gain experience with uh, small automation projects to get started with. I will now hand over the, the presentation to Stan uh, for very interesting applications and video examples.
Okay, so this uh, this first video here, it actually doesn't show um, our robot, but this is a, like an ideal automation, a lab automation system, because you have the Magna Motion conveyor moving all these uh, all these samples throughout the lab, and then you have different kinds of robots. So you'll see a few uh, a few different kinds of robots working on the same system, and they're able to. Uh, not stick to just one type of unit. So they have custom Cartesian systems. Uh, they have a six-axis robot. They have SCARA robots. Uh, and this is the ideal type of environment because they could, uh, let's say their process changes, they need another robot. They could get any kind of robot um, that they would like. And in our case, it's a bit easier to integrate, obviously, but there's some robots that are made for some applications and there's others that are suited for other kinds of applications. And if you have this kind of line where you could add uh, sort of carts or different components to it, um, that's, that's the kind of ideal uh, fully automated um, lab space that we would like to see. And we'll, we've really tried to focus our robot on making it easier to implement into these types of uh, situations. Next, please. Uh, Microplate handling, again, this is, uh, this is from Zymergen, uh, but this could be used at any lab automation company. Uh, once again, it's, very, it's a very simple thing for the robot to handle a microplate. Um, in this case, Zymergen has designed their own uh, gripper fingers, but we've worked with a few partners that have, uh, that have their own. So if you, if you don't want to create your own, there's, uh, we could put you in touch with people who could make custom uh, gripper fingers for your application as well. And you could also see that the robots here are mounted sideways or upside down, uh, but they could just be mounted flat uh, or on any surface. Next, please. Uh, vial or liquid handling. Again, this is something uh, this is something very simple for us and really flexible. So. Uh, one of the things that Louis mentioned is to start off small, and this is where we want to start off. You could just start off with one robot uh, for one instrument at a time, um, eventually expand to using it on many instruments. You could put the robot itself, uh, let's say, on a, on a slide so it could move between uh, different instruments as well. We really try to, uh, try to show the flexibility um, of the robot itself. And what, actually, uh, one of these robots was at the SLIS show, and what we've noticed is there's a huge um, there's a huge lack of robots at this show. And I think one of the reasons was that they weren't uh, easy for, uh, let's say, scientists or lab engineers uh, to use. And that's where we came in, and we're really much more adapted um, to being uh, to being used by these scientists because uh, we don't have our own programming language. The training is very quick, and the robot is more adapted to you. Uh, also, another mention here is that we do have a sleeve. Um, in this case, it's more to protect the robot than to protect the samples. So, if there's any splashing or debris going around, uh, we have partners that could uh, that could supply this this sleeve as well. Next, please. Uh, this is a, a dispensing application. This is an industrial dispensing application, uh, actually for the electronics and medical device industry. Uh, the reason we're showing it here in the lab automation is because we've took inspiration from uh, from something like this and to adapt it to a lab type environment. Already this was working uh, in a clean room environment, so the robot by its nature is very clean, so it doesn't generate a lot of particles. Um, so it can be used in, in uh, let's say, working with uh, pharmaceutical or medical device components. Um, but if we switch to the next slide, Louis. We'll see we have a partner out of Florida called Wiretank, uh, and they've sort of adapted uh, their system with our robot. So they have their own dispenser uh, that they could use for pipetting dispensing. It's obviously not as fast as a dedicated dispensing solution, but it's much more flexible. It's very compact. Uh, and the amazing thing is this robot, you could use the same robot. Uh, let's say you have a dispensing application to do for a few months. You could set it up very quickly, have it do a dispensing application. Uh, then if that part of your process is over, you don't need to do it anymore. You could readapt, uh, put different fingers on the robot, and then handle, uh, handle the microplates. So again, it shows um, this kind of flexibility that a six-axis robot could offer you uh, versus any other type of robot just because it does simulate uh, a robot arm. So really, uh, you could do anything that you want with it. Next, please. Uh, these are a few uh, new technologies that are coming that are coming in the works. Uh, so this is the Shunk Adhesio Gripper. Uh, it's it's made with a technology from Inosize out of Germany. Basically, without power and without electricity, you're able to take uh, these flat, uh, smooth surfaces, 
And you can see here in terms of liquid handling and lab automation, this is something very interesting. And again, this actually uh, requires a six axis robot arm because that end, um, the way to pick it up is basically you press on the material, but to release it, you have to turn the sixth axis uh, to release it from its grip. So this is something that's coming soon. Uh, we also have a long strobe uh, gripper in the works, so you'll be able to handle uh, a much greater variety of microplates with the same with the same fingers. So these are uh, things that are coming soon. I'll uh, transfer it back to Louis for the rest of the presentation. Um, well, I'll, I'll actually let Ilian uh, just go over uh, the surface of the technicals uh, of the Mecca 500. Yeah, thank you, Louis. Um, so I didn't really plan this, but since I'm in the lab, I'm, I might as well show you a little bit like the other types of robots. Um, so, uh, by, by the way, all the robots that I have in my lab, I really appreciate them, I love them, and they are really great for certain applications. Uh, but one thing is common in all, all, these, ro all these different uh, robots, is that they all have you know big controllers so for example this is the yumi it has uh, 500 uh, grams of payload uh, bigger reach but still a big controller and by the way it's collaborative uh, that's the biggest advantage and this here is another 500 gram pick and place robot from uh, fanuc and it's, it's very very fast but you see again it's a big controller lots of cables so basically even small industrial robots, they have huge controllers. That's it. And um, it's really difficult to, um, in my experience, um, it's, it's, it's quite difficult to, to program them. So, uh, for example, in my course, I need to teach, I need to pass at least two or three lectures before I leave my students to operate any of these robots. And so, um, once you get to know these robots, making a simple pick and place, it's not that difficult. They can even do it during the exam period. But the thing is that you need to, the learning curve is very steep. So you need to really spend a couple of days, sometimes even weeks of uh, training to be just to be able to learn how to do simple pick and place, you know. Um, so next, and, and of course, uh, all these robots are, are relatively expensive uh, because well first it's not only the robot you need to consider you have to sometimes you for example just to just to be able to control the robot from a pc something that i do in my lab well we need to buy an option for this um, also to install the robot since these robots are relatively big you need a bigger bigger table bigger structure everything needs to be bigger so it ends up being more expensive so whereas in the Mecha 500, the main, like the biggest advantage is that it's very, very compact. So everything, the controller is in the base and um, there is only a small power supply and you can plug it in, in, the, in any outlet. And of course, you have the emergency stop, the safety IOs on the, on the small uh, uh, power supply. So next. By the way, that's me. Uh, so, yeah, some people might say, oh, your, uh, your robot is very small. It's too small for applica my application because I need to go from this place to this place. But so their, their uh, you know, reflex is to just buy a bigger robot, which I think is wrong because many of our customers, they just put the, the robot, the Mecha 500 on a linear stage, and now they can, you know, enlarge their workspace uh, in a very, very affordable way. And they can still have something that is easy to use, that is easy to plug, to plug in. I mean, because the main advantage of, a rob of our robot is that you can just plug to uh, plug an ethernet cable and then control from uh, any uh, PC or PLC just by sending strings or by sending basic commands. And then you do the programming in your own language. Next. So um, basically, why use the Mecha 500 for lab automation? The robot is extremely precise, but you probably don't need this, but it's extremely compact. That's for sure something that you need. It's maintenance free. There is no oil to change. There are no batteries to change. For example, in my lab, because I don't use my, my robots very often, 
Uh, sometimes, especially during this uh, crisis, uh, uh, the batteries, they go dead. So now if I, if I need to use the robots, I have to change those batteries and they are also quite expensive in some cases. So it's very easy to integrate. You just bolt it in, in any orientation, clean by design, and it's very, very easy. It's, it's basically perfect for a modular system. Louis, I think that was my last. Okay, and, and of course, I already mentioned about this. Um, it's extremely easy to, to work with our robot. Basically, even if you've never used a robot, you just plug it uh, to a PC, you type the ether, Ethernet, uh, the IP address, and then you get what you see on the right here. The, it's basically a simple web interface. And of course, some, I, I, some companies, they, they really offer very, very sophisticated simulation uh, software for their robot, but you need to install it. You need to learn how to use it. And by experience, I know that, yes, it's powerful, but then if you just need to do pick, simple pick and place, like in uh, lab automation, why learn something, you know, so much uh, with so many options where, when you just need to do a simple pick and place? So uh, you, you can use TCP IP, you can use uh, socket messaging, you can use uh, EtherCAT, or in uh, very, very soon, you'll be able to control our robot with uh, Ethernet um, IP. So there is no property programming language, just about 50 commands. And then you, uh, if you want to do the variables, if you want to do conditions and stuff, you just use the language of your choice on the PC or POC of your choice. And there is no training required. Uh, basically, you can just read the technical documentation uh, in probably a couple of hours and you'll be able to uh, to use the robots. So very, very simple for simple application. Even for complex application, I've been doing in my lab stuff which is very advanced, like force control and stuff. And this, and even this is quite easy, but especially for pick and place, it's extremely easy. And um, I know it from experience. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. I think uh, we did have a few questions come out during uh, during the presentation that we're going to go through. Uh, one of the first ones that we've had is, is the robot uh, collaborative? Um, I'll try to answer that question. Maybe Elian will have some other comments. Uh, you have to understand that the whole application has to be collaborative. So we do have, first of all, there's different um, rules regarding labs and regarding production environments. Uh, we do have some customers who do a risk analysis and they're able to uh, run the robot in the open without any guarding. And just by the, the payload of the robot, it can't really hurt you. So we are using current control in real time. So if you do apply um, some force on the robot, it'll stop by itself. If it hits anything, uh, it'll stop as well. Uh, so this is something that comes up quite a lot, but you really have to consider um, the whole application if, if it's handling if it's handling something sharp or if you, the fingers that you designed are sharp, for instance, at that point, it's no longer a collaborative application. So you have to look at, at, the, at the full picture. I don't know, Elian, if you wanted to add anything to that. Well, I can only add that uh, you see here the, the Yumi robot is one collaborative robot. So everything is with padding and everything. So it's really, okay, I can say this one is safe. But if you look at other collaborative robots, uh, especially bigger ones uh, that I have in my lab, it's definitely more dangerous than ours. But that said, you know, officially we're not a collaborative robot. We don't have these collaborative uh, features because basically the robot is so small. So it's not really an issue to just close it in, in a robotic cell. Which also has advantages in terms of uh, avoiding human contamination or human errors when closing the robot in a cell uh, also has its sets of uh, advantages. Yep. Yeah. Uh, the other question was, why is a six-axis robot needed for lab automation? Um, it's actually not needed. It, it's going gonna, it's gonna to depend on the exact application you're doing. The, the fact that it's six-axis, though, gives you a lot of flexibility. So if you do want to use it to handle microplates, um, that it works for that application. If you want to use it to handle uh, vials, for instance, if you want to do a bit of shaking or stirring, you're able to uh, you're able to use the same uh, exact robot. So it's just a bit of manipulation. So you really, when you're using a six-axis robot, you have to think uh, that you're using a, a human arm in, in such a way so it could do the exact the exact thing that a, that a scientist could do. 
uh, the robot could do as well if you if you teach it the right way. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, some of the robots were mounted sideways uh, in the in the cells. Do we need to do any special configuration or anything uh, special to uh, in the settings? Um, nope. So it's actually uh, the robot by itself, the way it's packaged, you're able to put it upside down, sideways, uh, really, really any direction uh, that you want, and it self-compensates for that. So you really don't have to, uh, as you can see with Alien, you could actually run the same program, you could be holding it, and it'll, uh, and it'll work the same way. It's also a very light robot. The whole robot weighs under five kilos. It's actually uh, 4.5 kilos. Uh, so really, if you wanna, if you wanna mount it upside down, it's not, it's not an issue. Uh, is there any special protection for humid environments? Uh, yeah, we have we have a few partners that make sleeves. So we have that first sleeve that you guys saw uh, in one of the videos. That's for light protection um, against, uh, let's say, splashing or dust. But we also have an IP65 uh, sleeve that one of our partners makes. So if we do have a very humid environment or there's really a lot of liquid, uh, that can be used in these types of application. Uh, there's also sleeves where you could pump air inside inside the sleeve itself to completely protect the robot. Uh, so that's good. Uh, the clean room level that this robot could work in, uh, it's going to depend. Uh, well, first of all, the robot by its design is very clean. So the fact that we don't use any belts inside the robot, which generates the most particles, uh, and we're using harmonic drives which have the oil sealed inside them, uh, it's it's a very clean robot to start off with. We don't certify each one yet. It's going to be an option coming soon. Uh, but if you're running in an ISO um, class five, class six, or class seven uh, uh, clean room, the robot is not an issue. Uh, another question we had here is if I want to simulate um, the environment, uh, what could I use? Uh, so for simulation, we use uh, a software called RoboDK. Um, Ilian is really familiar with it. It was also uh, created by one of his uh, students a while back. Uh, but you're able to simulate not just our robot, almost any robot in uh, in RoboDK. Uh, and you're able to have your own CAD files. You could have your own, let's say, plate hotels that you could test if, if the robot has the reach that you want. You could add other components such as, uh, such as slides or different mechanisms. And you could really simulate that whole process. And for our robot, uh, it'll actually, you could either control it directly uh, once you get the robot, or you could export a Python file and, uh, and run that uh, on any PC connected uh, to the robot. These are the questions I've had. I think there's maybe a couple others that came out. Uh, yeah, if, uh, can we share the slides? Yeah, so the, the slides will be shared after. We're going to send an email to everyone. Uh, this whole presentation was recorded. Uh, there was pricing. Uh, for pricing, I'd suggest to get in contact with us, but it is uh, very reasonable for an industrial robot. So you're looking at an overall price of about uh, 15,000 uh, US dollars. Um, and it's really, uh, for us, it's not necessarily a starting price. We have a few options like the grippers. Um, but uh, in terms of the robot, the software, we don't have any special licensing. Uh, we don't have uh, we don't have any maintenance on the robot to do. So this is a fully uh, maintenance-free robot, uh, and it's, it's priced uh, uh, very competitively. Uh, somebody asked if we have a LabVIEW library. So we do have a LabVIEW example that we could share. Um, but again, it's not it's not a full library yet, although that is in the plans. Uh, we're really, for the communication, it's really just ASCII strings uh, that we're sending and rece uh, receiving uh, over TCP IP, so any language can be used, and we have examples available that we could, uh, that we could send you. Um, there's also uh, the maximum force that the robot could apply. Uh, we've done a few tests, so we could apply about uh, about 100 newtons, 110 newtons, I believe, uh, or 25 pounds in front of the robot. It's going to really depend on uh, on the way you place it. So because of it's a six-axis robot, it's sort of like your arm, right? So if you're using just one axis to apply a force versus if you're using the whole axis, you'll have a different uh, maximum force. Uh, another question was if it works with uh, ROS. So yes, we do have uh, we do have integra integration with ROS available. Um, that's on our GitHub page. You'll also find our uh, Python API there as well. 
Um, and for some other examples, uh, they're available on uh, support at mechademic.com. Okay, I think that's all. Uh, don't worry if I didn't have time to answer some of your other questions. Uh, there's going to be a follow-up email that's sent uh, to everybody. You're going to be able to see the recording. Uh, and if you have any questions, just visit support.macademic.com. Uh, you can create a ticket, and one of our applications engineers uh, is going to answer you fairly quickly. Okay? So uh, thank you, uh, Ilian. Thank you, uh, Louis. I guess there's someone in the background. Thank you to everyone who has uh, who has joined us. Uh, we really appreciate it. We uh, we weren't expecting honestly such a big turnout, uh, but we've had quite a lot of people. So uh, 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 thanks to everyone here. Thanks to everyone in the lab automation space. If you have anything, any ideas for how to use our robots, please let us know. Um, we haven't been working in that space for so long, so we uh, we really we really look forward to all your input. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.